on the tools once again. <laughs> have you been on the tools before? I've done this before. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I haven't flip flopped. I said no originally, then I said yes, then I have said no, and I've stuck to it. Oh, why I'll I wipe out there on my TV? Google it, mate. Hey, <laughs> I'm going to tell the Prime Minister that one. A curry for the country, I love it. I love Indian food. Give me my Valium. Give me my Valium. How can anyone do this? Do you ever wonder who's responsible for all of this? Where on earth does Australian politics actually come from? Well, the answer depends how far back in time you want to travel. If you have any friends who are Greek or who have Greek heritage, there's a good chance they'll have an answer to that question. You would have had that conversation which goes along the lines of them saying they're from the greatest country in the world, we invented democracy, we invented Western philosophy, we invented the theatre, we invented the Olympics. And then upon receiving this Hellenic barrage, you'll say something along the lines of, yeah, and it's just a bit of a shame about everything that's happened since then, isn't it? When I started fleshing out this video, I was half expecting to find the whole Greeks inventing democracy cliche was just a rule of thumb rather than a historical fact and that it actually started in like Mesopotamia or somewhere on the steppes in the Bronze Age or something. But no, I will pay it to the Greeks. It looks like, to the best of anyone's knowledge, democracy really did start in Greece. Now when we think of ancient Greek Athenian democracy, we are thinking about something very different from the democracy we see today. It isn't what we now know as representative democracy, where we elect our best and brightest to go and sit in parliament and make informed decisions in the national interest on our behalf. Greek city-state democracy wasn't about outsourcing like that. If you wanted to say in decisions, you turned up to the fucking parliament yourself provided you were an adult, non-enslaved male citizen. And if you were an adult, non-enslaved male citizen, sounds all right, doesn't it? You'd just turn up with your boys at the Ecclesia and put your hands up when you heard an idea you liked. Direct democracy, no layers of bureaucracy, just rock up to the relevant parliament and shout around some good ideas, and if enough people put their bloody hand up and say, yeah, nice idea, then you'll go off and you'll do the thing. Sounds pretty fair. But direct democracy still has a lot of critics. Now modern criticisms tend to focus on the exclusionary aspects of the system, the women, the slaves and the non-citizens who weren't represented. But direct democracy also received a lot of criticism from the ancients themselves, for the complete opposite reason. It was too inclusive. Plato and Aristotle and Thucydides, the real big dogs of the day, they all thought that direct democracy was a bad idea, simply because the general public was too boneheaded to dictate matters of state. And also just too incredibly brutal as well, like when the Melians refused to become subjects of Athens, so the demos voted for what became the siege of Melos after which they executed the entire male population and sold all of the women and all of the children into slavery. Not the best PR move if you're into that. The Demos clearly didn't have an in-house spin doctor. And consider also when the Demos famously voted to execute Socrates for corrupting the minds of the young and of believing in supernatural things of his own invention. Since Plato pretty much used Socrates as his muse for all of his pontificating and philosophizing, you can imagine he took this pretty badly. And whether through sympathy for Socrates or otherwise, you have plenty of governments today who took Plato seriously, and who decided that democracy isn't the way to go. There is a chance that a few dictatorships and failed states today didn't choose their path solely out of sympathy for Socrates, but they are right about one thing. Democracy is messy. And for those of us who have decided to persist with democracy, we've gradually found ways to make it less messy. We've put some parameters on it. We've developed representative systems and parliaments and the rule of law and the separation of powers and all manner of institutions which take many different forms in many different countries. But it's still messy, to some degree, pretty much everywhere. It's the price we pay for giving people a say. And even though he's the big daddy of big cancellations right now, I do like that Churchill quote that democracy is the worst form of government except for all of the others which have been tried from time to time. I like that because it honestly is a fucking miracle that democracy develops anywhere, let alone survives. And especially so in far-flung weird corners of the earth with weird combinations of millennia-old cultures clashing right up against modern nations who used that same land as a dumping ground for the prisoners they were running out of room to jail. There wasn't much in all that that predestined Australia to becoming the liberal democratic paradise we know and love today. But as anyone who's ever watched Question Time will be able to tell you, the democratic choices we make as citizens aren't quite as unconstrained as what they had in Greece. You don't just turn up to parliament and have a chin wag with all the other citizens. The parameters Australia's developed to make our democracy less messy haven't just constrained our choices, they've arguably boiled them all the way down to a singular choice between two alternatives. Do you want to be led by the Labor Party, or do you want to be led by the Coalition? Of all the choices we might have been given, that's the one we ended up getting. And this video is about just how we got that choice. How on earth did we end up with these two?
Compared with most of the world, Australia is a wealthy country. Some people say that's down to our luck through a strong endowment of natural resources, the dirt for building things and burning things that we dig out of the ground and sell to other people. But resources don't get you too far if your institutions are no good. If resources were enough, then the Congo would be a wealthier country than Singapore. Australia's resources don't hurt its bottom line, but they only count because, comparatively, Australia's political and economic institutions developed to be largely open and inclusive. Again, the word comparatively is key. There's still a lot to complain about depending on who you are, but most countries have even more to complain about. A lot of places with comparable colonial pasts didn't develop anything approaching Australia's relatively open democratic political and economic structures. And this is in large part due to what was already happening here. There's a through line that spans every corner of the world that was colonised by Europeans, and that's that the institutions established there depended on the conditions that presented themselves on arrival. The Spanish and the Portuguese were generally quicker than the British to start playing the OG Age of Empires, and their strategy was to go for the areas with the most natural resources to steal and the largest populations of indigenous people to enslave. So not here, and not here. Here. The Spanish and the Portuguese set up the archetypal New World societies, in which a small European aristocracy oversaw millions of miserable disenfranchised peasants, who were forced to extract as much gold, silver, sugar and cotton from the land as possible. This sort of mass mobilisation of the existing population to create societies based around resource extraction wasn't a possibility in the land that eventually became the USA, and it wasn't a possibility in Australia. Now, to be completely clear again, what occurred after Europeans arrived in Australia was horrific. This has not been fully reckoned with yet. The point I am making here is not that the British were benevolent occupiers who elected not to do the same thing as the Spanish and Portuguese, but because of Australia's sparsity and its lack of any comparable existing industries or institutions to co-opt, and its largely fragmented indigenous population, Australia wasn't as completely captured by the same imperative to forcibly extract and steal resources that you saw in Peru or Brazil or the Congo. And because the British couldn't get a similar operation going down under, along with the contemporaneous issues they were having in their own American colony, they decided to limit the land's purpose to being a dumping ground for convicts, who after becoming emancipated were pretty much just left to themselves and were eventually joined by free settlers looking for new opportunities. They didn't get much help from the British, but they weren't taxed incredibly onerously and they did receive some foundational British institutions for the courtesy of not rebelling like those other troublemakers at the time. Australia's political direction was largely set, therefore, by the emancipated convicts and free settlers who came here, free will or otherwise, and who kind of had to do it themselves. Representative democracy came to Australia very early. A lot of people say it was born at the Eureka Stockade, but this does a disservice to the real reasons. Australian democracy was born thanks to the unnamed diggers and the stonemasons and the shop workers who met at markets and in hotels and on the goldfields to engage in the one thing that united them all, complaining about the British. Complaining in the first instance about the Brits' continued shipping of unwanted convicts down south. The free settlers of Australia, the weirdos who actually decided to come down on their own initiative, they didn't like convicts very much. Convict gangs were seen at the time as hotbeds of homosexual vice. And eventually this perception and the continued lobbying of the British governors drove the abolition of transportation and the breaking down of divisions between settlers and emancipated prisoners. But just as one dividing line came down, more lines were then drawn between, on one hand, the liberals and radicals who wanted a democracy similar to that which was evolving in Britain, and on the other hand, the conservative landowners, the squatters, the elites of the day who didn't want democracy because they were scared that it would see confiscation of their land by the unwashed masses. The liberals and the radicals won, and responsible government came to most of the colonies in the 1850s, still a whole 50 years before the Australian colonies would unite to become Australia. Now, the fact that representative democracy, for some people, came to Australia is one thing, but it's another thing that after arriving, it actually survived. This wasn't guaranteed either, thanks to the rampant, unmasked corruption that occurred back in the day. For example, Victoria might have gotten itself a legislature in the 1850s like most of the other states, but it was dominated so completely by squatters in its first iteration that they established a secret fund to simply bribe members of the assembly. Political parties didn't exist in this world, just the personalities of the members, of which the loudest, dodgiest and most macho generally ascended to the leadership. The 22nd Premier of Victoria was a man called Tommy Bent, who in the 1880s was the minister in charge of railways. And if you look at a rail map of Melbourne and check out the links from Brighton to Sandringham and Caulfield to Cheltenham, 
They were all built in the space of a couple of years, when Tommy Bent went on what by all accounts was an unhinged spending spree, which developed railway lines directly in line with his personal property holdings. Tommy Bent was so dodgy that he pretty much single-handedly caused the downfall of the entire government, when enough people outside his electorate started to realise that all of these train lines seemed to be popping up in the exact same spots. But even this scandal didn't stop him from becoming Premier over 20 years later. And that's also despite The Age publishing verifiable letters that Bent had written as Railways Minister in 1881, offering MPs railway lines in their electorates in exchange for their votes. It didn't stop him from becoming Premier, and it also didn't stop him from being immortalised with a statue that, at the time of making this, still sits at the corner of Bay Street and the Nepean Highway in Brighton, Melbourne. And if you live nearby in Bentley, guess what? Your suburb was named after him. So Australian colonial politics was a game of personalities rather than collectives. And in a sense, this made it a kind of halfway house between what we have now and whatever the Athenians were doing back in 500 BC. There was arguably more flexibility in decision making purely because no one leader or party or collective ever had absolute control over the parliament. Compromise wasn't the stuff of nightmares it's considered to be this century, because back then it was an absolute necessity to get anything done. And this meant that in practice, brief coalitions would form around single issues like tariffs or land reform or education or a spontaneous outbreak of bush ranging, and then fall apart just as quickly as the next issue came along. The issue with this is pretty clear. With the added flexibility comes ceaseless instability. New South Wales had 26 ministries before 1890, with Charles Cowper, John Robertson and Henry Parks each being Premier five separate times each. At one point, South Australia went through 47 governments in 36 years. Ministries weren't held together by ideology or a shared policy vision. This isn't possible when your government's average lifespan is nine months. Ministries were instead, through necessity and by design, held together through varying combinations of personal loyalty, promises of spending and patronage in the form of contracts and jobs. With the shape of Australia's colonial parliament shifting so quickly all the time, so impulsively, so apparently randomly, it was hard to see who was friends with who, who owed who favours, and who held the true power. This short-term system of brief coalitions was ubiquitous, but it wasn't an equilibrium. Nature certainly abhors a vacuum, but so do politicians, and labels eventually started to be assigned to individuals and groups. Labels that have, to some degree, stood the test of time. Some politicians became comfortable referring to themselves as liberals and they tended to be pro-free trade, in contrast with the much more helpfully named protectionists, who to everyone's shock and amazement supported protectionism. This was probably the first proper, visible cleavage of the colonial parliament into long-standing rival factions, at least most of the time. If only things were that simple, because in Victoria, the word liberal took on a completely different meaning. Victoria was where a Scottish upstart called David Syme founded a small newspaper called The Age, and adopted the German conception of liberalism at the time, which linked the term with protectionism rather than free trade, the total opposite of pretty much everywhere else. A lot of people from outside Australia get weirded out by the fact that the modern Liberal Party is the main conservative force in Australian politics. In the USA, a Liberal is generally a centre-left or centrist Democrat. It's a centrist label in the UK as well, and in a lot of European countries. But Australia's conception of the word liberalism is not only very confusing, it predates Australia itself. And the reason it's still a confusing label here is because nobody was ever able to agree what it actually meant. According to Syme and The Age, to be a liberal was to support the true productive classes, the manufacturers, the farmers and the working men, the ones who actually make things. It meant that you stood against the squatters and the merchants, the parasitic sectionalists who lived off the rents they extracted from the hardware work of the actual producers. And in Victoria, based on this, we saw the emergence of the first shadow of a political party, with the radical Graham Berry forming the National Reform and Protection League, closely observed by his protege one, Alfred Deakin. This first clear demarcation between political science, that of free trade versus protectionism, was now what started the ball rolling with respect to the development of proper political parties. And add to this another dividing line that was just as controversial and not as widely acknowledged today as it might be, religion. You might recognise some more recent demagogues in Australia's history who have leveraged religious differences to scapegoat Muslims, but the tradition of doing this goes back a long way too, all the way to the split between Protestants and Catholics. Ever since Henry VIII split from the Catholic Church after getting into a hissy fit with the Pope about whether or not he could divorce his first wife, the British Empire has more often than not been a recognisably Protestant enterprise. And this was reflected largely in the Europeans who chose to come to Australia, who tended to be very Protestant and very individualistic. Perhaps 
perhaps even more so than the UK average at the time, due to a disproportionate adherence to non-conformist and evangelical strands, evangelising and long voyages overseas kind of go hand in hand. And this meant that a lot of these Protestants who arrived in Australia identified quite strongly with the monarchy. But a significant minority of other Christian arrivals to Australia, the Catholics, didn't. In 1868, Prince Alfred came down to visit Australia, and in one public appearance, an Irishman and former trainee for the Catholic priesthood sprung up out of nowhere and right after yelling, I'm a Fenian, God save Ireland, shot him in the back. Luckily for Alfred, the buckle on his suspenders stopped the bullet from lodging in his body and he made a full recovery. The Irishman, who was executed a month later, didn't make a full recovery. Any good politician knows never to waste a crisis. And the colonial secretary at the time, a man we've mentioned, Henry Parks, saw a political opportunity in the assassination attempt. Parks decided a great way to solidify Protestant support was to play out the assassination attempt as some sort of broader Catholic conspiracy, even though this was almost certain to have not been the case. This built on pre-existing distrust between Catholics and Protestants, who were already bickering over government funding of churches and schools. Catholics wanted continued state aid for church schools, while advocates for a smaller government, who tended to be Protestant, considered this an inefficient way to deliver universal education. And when Parks, who eventually became New South Wales Premier took away state funding for all denominational schools in New South Wales, he sealed his reputation among Australia's Catholics as a bigoted sectarian. Yet while the Catholics were targeted by some in politics, they still made up between a fifth and a quarter of the colonial population. And that's a large enough group that there was widespread belief that the harvesting of the Catholic vote was key to electoral success. Which means that compared with a lot of other minorities in Australia's past, the Catholic population weren't completely excluded. The same can't be said for the Chinese or Aboriginal populations. More for that matter, for women. So first we had the free-flowing, openly corrupt free-for-all phase, followed by a period where dividing lines were first drawn between protectionists and free traders, and then along sectarian lines. But while both of these fault lines ran deep through Australia, neither of them were quite deep enough to create a permanent ideological split between political classes. Both of them saw individuals come and go between issues, weaponise them when convenient, and use them to form and dissolve coalitions around individual leaders. But the next movement was powerful enough to create a permanent rift. The next movement was that of organised labour. Unionism had started growing incredibly early in Australia, having built steadily since the 1850s, with one of its first notable achievements being the ability of Melbourne's building unions, led by the stonemasons, to achieve a standard eight-hour working day in 1856. This was a global first. Unionism grew first gradually, but then, in the 1880s, very quickly. They didn't just strike outside the parliament, they worked to get inside. And this was the basis for the most consequential division in Australia's political history, the one that has lasted right through to today, the split between capital and labour. It might surprise you, it certainly surprised me, that the true formation of the Labour Party occurred in, of all places, fucking Queensland, just before Federation in the 1890s. The legend attributes the founding of Queensland Labour to a meeting of striking pastoral workers under a ghost gum tree, the Tree of Knowledge, in Barcolden, Queensland, in 1891. Thanks to the introduction of pay for parliamentarians in 1889, the Labour movement was actually able to convince its members to run for office. This wasn't really possible before you could get paid for being a politician. We like to complain now about how much they get paid, but the complete absence of pay for politicians that existed before 1889 was less an austerity measure than a simple barrier to prevent any working class people from becoming politicians. Before that point, politics was a sporting activity done by the landed gentry, like polo or whatever. But once the pay came, the working class, like magic, started picking up seats. Labour pretty quickly became a party which held the balance of power. They weren't a major party early on, but they could hold the parliament hostage and favour whichever party caved and gave them what they wanted, primarily measures around tax, mining, shops and the exclusion of Chinese immigrants who they maintained were driving down wages. And just how did Labour become this powerful this quickly? On one hand, the answer is simple and attributable to the latent demand from the working class for political representation, who now all of a sudden had a movement they could identify with. But in no small part, it was due to another overlapping group, the Catholics we spoke about earlier. It was true that working class Protestants sometimes voted Labour, but Catholics? They generally always voted Labour. By the early 20th century, Irish Catholics comprised a quarter of Australia's population. They were largely working class, and they were often drawn to Labour's communitarian emphasis, 
at stress on social welfare and equality, its tendency to support greater government spending, such as on denominational schooling. Catholics hadn't forgotten Henry Park's attempts to make an example of them decades earlier. They didn't like Parks, they didn't like the free trade he advocated for, they didn't like squatters, and they didn't like the weird Protestant individualism of the moderate small L liberals like Alfred Deakin either. So that left them with one choice. They voted for the Labour Party. To step back for a moment, this phenomenon of organised Labour gaining a foothold inside the halls of Parliament was, until this time, essentially unheard of anywhere on Earth, because after a couple of skittish minority leaderships in 1910, the Australian Labor Party had grown to the extent that it could form not just the first majority government in Australia, but the first majority Labor government in the entire world. The other two parties, the Free Traders and the Protectionists, had done everything they could to stop this. George Reid of the Free Trade Party had tried to whip up opposition before the 1906 election by renaming his Free Trade Party as the very poetic, very subtle, very nuanced, anti-socialist party. But that wasn't enough. So in 1909, the anti-socialist party, formerly known as the Free Trade Party, merged, incredibly ironically, with the protectionists. And they named this new party the Liberal Party. This 1909 Liberal Party has undergone a few mergers and name changes, but it is a direct ancestor to today's Liberal Party, meaning that the dichotomy we see today has existed for essentially all of Australia's history. Since 1909, Australia's political landscape has been dominated by the Labor Party and whoever was able to pull together a strong enough coalition to oppose the Labor Party. And in the next video, we'll talk about why this division became permanent, how the split between Labor and non-Labor has now lasted for over 100 years how despite scandals and schisms and ruptures and full-blown internal party civil wars, Australia's major parties have somehow, essentially, survived to today.